start with Thomas's idea of created grace as it applies to the light of glory. Now we've had some debate already about whether or not there is created grace, and um, the response of several of the Thomists is that Thomas really does posit a participation in the divine life, in the divine nature. Um, that may be. He may say that in other places. Um, he does seem to say that. However, since God is absolutely simple in the Thomistic scheme, how is it that we participate in divine life and we don't participate in divine simplicity? Isn't divine life the divine essence? According to Thomas it is. All things predicated of God are the, are the divine essence. So if we participate in divine life, divine nature, we participate in the divine substance, which is one, which is absolutely simple and includes all the other predicates. So that's not possible. What about the vision of glory? In question 12, article 5, Thomas discusses, discusses the notion of the created light that's necessary for the righteous to see the divine essence which itself is problematic, but without getting into that, Thomas says that <clears throat> when any created intellect sees the essence of God, the essence of God itself becomes the intelligible form of the intellect. Hence it is necessary that some supernatural disposition be added to the intellect in order that it be raised up to such a great sublime height. So in other words, supernatural grace is necessary in order to see the divine essence which becomes the intelligible form in the human intellect I mean how that that's utterly uh, idolatrous God's essence has no form not even on Thomistic, Thomistic grounds and so even though we're even if we're deified how is it that our minds which are still created form an image of the divine essence and see it quote-unquote now some of the detractors from the Thomas might respond by saying well that's that's not what it means to see it. Thomas says clearly right here that it becomes the intelligible form of the human intellect in, in glory. And further, he goes on in reply to objection one, <clears throat> where the objection was that God himself is that light, and so the created intellect doesn't need, um, I'm sorry, so the intellect does not need created light in glory to see the divine essence. It will see it directly. Thomas says, yeah, it will see it directly, but it's necessary to see, <clears throat> created light is necessary to see the essence of God, not in order to make the essence of God intelligible, <clears throat> which is itself intelligible, but in order to enable the intellect to understand it in the same way as a habit makes a power abler to, abler to act. Even so, corporeal light is necessary in regards to external sight. He makes this a little bit clearer in objection two. He says this light is required to see the divine essence, this created light not as a similitude in which God is seen, but as a perfection of the intellect, strengthening it to see God. Clearly that's created grace. Therefore it may be seen, it may be said that this light is to be described not as a medium in which God is seen, but as one by which he is seen. Such a medium does not take away, however, the direct vision of God. How that is is not really clear, but we're supposed to believe that we do see God directly, but still through the medium of created grace. So, we have created grace even in the eschaton. And created grace is not grace proper to the creature, as the Thomas keeps saying. Created grace is some other thing. It's, it's something added to the intellect. Right? So, it's some other thing other than what we have naturally, because it's supernatural grace. And it's not the divine light itself, because it's created. So, in other words... Creatures have to be brought to a creaturely perfection, which is a created grace, some other state of affairs, some other state of being in the eschaton in order to see the essence of God. That's created grace. That's not a direct, it's still not a direct face-to-face uh, -face theosis, quote-unquote. Now the Thomas will respond by saying, well, <clears throat> no, not in this life, but it is direct in the eschaton, even though we just saw that it's a medium. It's a medium that provides it to be direct, whatever that means. <clears throat> Thomas reaffirms Augustine's teaching of the Old Testament theophanies as holograms. 
the reason the Old Testament theophanies are holograms for Augustine in, in, on the Trinity is because the absolutely simple essence of God cannot, strictly speaking, manifest in some sort of particular localized manifestation within time and space. Uh, so what has to happen is God has to present himself through the medium of some kind of hologram or angelic manifestation or something like that that takes place and then ceases to exist. Romanides has a good article about this. Um, this is in books two and three of On the Trinity where he talks about this. So you can look that up if you doubt me. What Thomas himself is going to say, the question is, this is article 12, question 12, article 11, whether anyone in this life can see the essence of God. On the contrary, it is written, man shall not see me and live, Exodus 33, 20. The gloss on this says, in this mortal life, God can be seen by certain image, images, but not the likeness of his own divine nature. And see, because there's no distinction between nature and person and God's uh, operations and his essence, the medieval scholastics, as the gloss on the text says, presume that there's no that God has to reveal himself through created mediums because of the fact that he's an absolutely simple essence. So if God manifested, it would be the divine essence manifesting, which is impossible. So what is what does it have to be? Well, it has to be then some kind of angelic manifestation or temporary hologram. According to, he says, in, Thomas says in the reply to the objections, according to Dionysius, Man is said in Scripture to, be, to see God in the sense that certain figures are formed in the senses and imagination according to some similitude, representing in part the divinity. So when Jacob says, I have seen God face to face, this does not mean that he saw the divine essence, but some figure representing God. This is to be preferred to some high mode of prophecy. God speaks through an imaginary vision. And then he goes on to say that Jacob was exalted in intellectual contemplation and saw some sort of angelic vision. As God works miracles in corporeal things, so also he do, does these supernatural wonders in the common order, raising the minds of men, the minds of some men living in the flesh beyond the use of senses, and even up to the vision of his own essence. So Thomas does allow for rare cases of uh, the human soul being lifted up into the third heavens to, to quote unquote see the divine essence. Um, so in other words Aquinas reaffirms Augustine's teachings of the angelic theophanies but every other church father had taught that those theophanies are the logos it's the divine person the logos manifesting it's not some hologram it's not some temporary creation of God brought into being and then dropped out of being so that God, because God can't directly appear when Solomon prays that the Shekinah glory would come down into the temple in Chronicles, he prays and he says that the heavens cannot contain God, nor does God dwell in temples made with human hands, and yet God does condescend to come down into the temple. So there's an apparent paradox. And so and, and everybody in the temple prostrates himself. So so it is God. It is truly God that's there manifesting in that in that as that glory cloud, as a certain divine energy but it's not the divine essence, right? That's the only view that makes sense of this. An absolute divine simplicity com commits you to some kind of angelic hologram manifestation, which is just bizarre. It's not what's going on. I know that Galatians 4 says that the, the law was given by angels. So I'm not denying that there were angels going on. I know that Galatians 4 says that the, the law was given by angels. So I'm not denying that there were angels present there, but it's still the logos. It's still directly face to face interaction with the logos that's what's key because paul says that's going to be normative uh what was what was a rare occurrence in the old covenant is going to be normative for us in the new covenant he says in second Corinthians three that we now see christ face to face <clears throat> thomas goes on and talks about uh the second article, when he talks, I'm sorry, uh, question 13, article 2, he says that creatures re represent in some way the divine essence. Now, he does say that we should do some kind of via negativa, some kind of apophatic theology, because the creaturely perfections or quasi-perfections don't really 
totally match. They're not univocal. They don't match up to godly God's perfection and His being perfectly, but they bear an analogical similarity. So Thomas's doctrine of analogia entis, or the analogy of being, is one of similitude. So we can find a similarity, a comparison between the creaturely quasi perfections and the divine essence itself. The way this works is we look at creatures and we say. Well, that, that thing has being, this is one example, but it has contingent being, right? The TV has some kind of being, but it, it wasn't a necessary being, it's contingent being. And so, there had to be some kind of self-subsisting super being, super essence that created and caused that temporal essence. Well, the divine nature, according to Scripture, has absolutely no similarity to created things. We read this in Acts 17:29, and we <clears throat> read through Romans 1, and really any of the uh, uh, admonitions against idolatry in Scripture apply, uh, especially mental uh, imagery of the divine nature, because what Thomas actually says is that he says that we do in question. In Article 13, Question 2, that we do substantially predicate things of God's essence. <clears throat> it's not exhaustive when we say that God's essence is holy or eternal or just or whatever. All these predicates are the divine essence. We're not exhaustively saying what he is, but we are saying what he is in some substantial way. He says, therefore, we must hold a different doctrine, that these names that I've listed, for example, signify the divine substance and are predicated substantially of God, although they fall short of a full representation of Him. <clears throat> Since our intellect knows God from creatures, it knows Him as far as creatures represent Him. But creatures don't represent the divine essence at all. Not one bit. Creatures do represent the energies of God. They represent the person, right? Human fathers are an image of God the Father. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Paul, we can learn from uh, uh, from creation some of the wisdom and skill of God, which are operations or energies of God. But we don't look at creatures and say, oh, well, that's kind of what the divine essence is like. I mean, the seraphim are, are covering their eyes. They can't even look at God. So how much more ridiculous is it for us to look at creatures, material creation, and say, oh, yeah, that's the divine essence is kind of like that. If you read the monologian of Anselm, it's exactly what he does. He starts off with creaturely per quasi-perfections and substances and reasons up, quote-unquote, to how there has to be this great super-substance, which is this absolutely simple monad. In reply to objection three of that same question, Thomas says, We cannot know the essence of God in this life as he really is in himself. We know him accordingly as he is represented in the perfections of creatures, or the quasi-perfections of creatures, actually. He goes on, there's a few more questions. The next few questions deal with this, this very issue. <clears throat> um, in question 6, I'm sorry, Article 7, question 13, Article 7, he goes into more detail about the analogy of being, which is the his basis for how we know God. And he talks about how paternity or fatherhood, he quotes Ephesians 3.14, that all paternity in heaven and on earth is named from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's fine. It's applied to God the Father or to one of God's operations. You know, if we talk about human justice being an image of divine justice or whatever, that's fine. None of those things are statements about God's essence. And there's absolutely no reason to think that. The only reason Thomas says that is because of his presupposition of absolute divine simplicity. That anything predicated of God, and anything about God, anything in God, is simply the divine essence. Everything. Everything. Totally. Across the board. We're going to see that. <clears throat> um, I want to move on to the divine architects, divine images... Uh, even though in, uh, um, well, I'll skip that, but 
Question 15, the thing that I've been arguing for the past three weeks, he says it clear as day. Question 15, Article 1, are there ideas? On the contrary, as Augustine says, such as the power inherent in ideas that no one can be wise unless they are understood. Now, Augustine's view is a kind of Neoplatonic divine exemplarism where the archetypes of things, universals of things, are stuck in the essence of God. Because Why? Because God's absolutely simple. There's no other place to stick it in God. So, <clears throat> after a little bit of argumentation, when, when Thomas replies to the first three objections, which you can go read them for yourself, Thomas makes clear what his view is. God does not understand things according to an idea existing outside of himself. Thus, Aristotle rejects the opinion of Plato, who held that ideas existed of themselves and not in the intellect. Although God knows himself and all else by his essence, yet his essence is the operative principle of all things except himself. God is the similitude of all things according to his essence. There we go. So that's the basis of the analogy of being, of natural theology. Therefore, an idea in God is identical with his essence. Did you catch that? So all the universals, all the archetypes, all the meanings or plans or forms of things, blueprints of things, are the divine essence. They're all one in him. Now, given the explanation of absolute divine simplicity, that means that they're no different than any of the other attributes. They're no different than justice. They're no different than wisdom. They're no different than Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that in a minute where Thomas says that the persons in God are no different than the essence of God. They're, actually, they're absolutely the same. So we have an Augustinian exemplarism clearly advocated by Thomas Aquinas. In the next questions, uh, 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 question 15, article 2, he tries to explain how they're different. And I don't see how that can be. I mean, you could you can... Uh, read it for yourself and see if you think that it's that it's uh, convincing but what he actually says is that it is not repugnant to the simplicity of God that it understand many things but see it understands many things through the differences through the different archetypes in the essence but there are no real distinctions in God's essence Thomas says that the distinctions that we make about God as humans are formal they're not they don't exist in ray in reality they only exist in our heads but what we're talking about here is God ad intra in himself. So they don't, they don't exist in him. Thomas says, inasmuch as he knows his essence perfectly, he knows, it, he knows the different ideas according to every mode in which they can be known. Now it can be known only as it is in itself, but it, as it can be participated in by creatures according to some degree of likeness. I'm sorry, it can be known not only as it is in itself, but every creature has its own proper species according to which it participates to some degree to the likeness of the divine essence. So you see the, the universal stuck, does that mean? I answer that as said above, truth is found in the intellect as it apprehends that a thing is. So truth is proper to being. And in things according as they have being conformable to an intellect. This is to the greatest degree found in God. For his being is not only conformed to his intellect, but it is the very act of his intellect. And his act of understanding is the measure and cause of every other being and every other intellect. And he himself is his own existence and act of understanding. He is truth in itself, the sovereign and first truth. In other words, he is what he has he is what he has he person is what he has nature person is nature modalism and you say oh well that's just one quote oh no all of book one is packed full of statements about absolute divine simplicity and the meaning of that the meaning of that is that all these things are exactly the same as the divine essence <clears throat> we move on. And you know, I mean, there's a whole there's there's a whole question on on divine simplicity. Uh, you, you, I mean, I skipped that over because I assume that the people 
I mean, let's look. Okay, let's look at the simplicity of God. The simplicity of God. This is question three. God's not a body. God's not composed of matter and form. Okay. What's the third article? God is the same as His essence. I mean, how, it couldn't be any more any clearer. He is His essence. He person is His essence. And all you all you'll see in question three is just statement after statement after statement after statement after statement about what divine simplicity is, and this is all squeezed into this Aristotelian frame. This part is the other part was Neoplatonic. This part is to squeeze into a an Aristotelian framework where uh, the idea is that if we were to make any kind of distinction, that would be that would mean composition. So God can't have any kind of distinctions. Because distinction, sorry, I know, they might be giants. Is going to get a little distracting here. I'll change it up. No one could take me seriously while listening to Linnell and Flansburg in the background. So Thomas says, since God is not composed of matter and form, He must be His own Godhead, His own life, and whatever else is predicated of Him. Did you catch that? This is Article Three. God is whatever is predicated of him he is that simply it's clear why do you not get this so <clears throat> everything about god is his essence it's just it's just that simple i mean look in in thomas's treatise on divine simplicity who does he quote in arguments against john john damascus he quotes rabbi Maimonides, the premier proponent of medieval Jewish divine simplicity. So we're supposed to believe that Aristotle and Maimonides had a better understanding than St. John of Damascus because in the treatise on divine simplicity, Aquinas rejects John of Damascus' arguments for the essence energy distinction. That alone ought to tell you that he doesn't believe in the essence energy distinction and the two views are incompatible. And again, I mean seriously, why am I supposed to accept that Maimonides and uh, Aristotle c constitute good arguments against John of Damascus. I mean, seriously. So, so we've seen simplicity then. It's very clear. I mean, Thomas is over and over and over. Uh, we'll see him say it again. Here we go. Uh, question 18 is about the life of God. I pointed this out now a few times. <clears throat> Are all things in life in God life? Thomas says, On the contrary, what was made in him was life. John 1, 3, and 4. All things therefore in life are God. Are life in God. I answer that in God to live is to understand. In God intellect is the thing understood and the act of understanding, and all are one and the same. Hence whatever is under as understood. Whatever's in God is understood is the very living or life of God. Therefore, since all things that have been made by God are in Him as things understood, it follows that all in Him are the divine life itself. Again, because of absolute divine simplicity, all things are, the, are one in God. Now he goes on to explain how this is, and he again affirms the Augustinian view of divine exemplarism. I mean, I learned this in college, and I mean, I learned that Thomas Aquinas accepted in Bible Baptist Bible College that Thomas Aquinas accepted Augustine's doctrine of divine exemplarism in its central aspects. Okay, I know he, they differ a little bit on what's going on on the human side of this. Understand that but when it comes to God, they don't differ. They both stick the archetypes, the, the blueprints, the forms, whatever, in God's essence. Thomas says, in him we live and move and have our being. That means, uh, there's, that what that means is, all things are in God through their proper ideas, which are not distinct from the divine essence. Hence things are in God, hence things in God are the divine essence. I'm not saying that, that Thomas is saying here that actual creatures are in the divine essence. No, Thomas is saying that the blueprints or archetypes or forms or images 
the divine exemplars are stuck in the divine essence now that's not necessarily it's not wrong to talk about divine archetypes or blueprints or predeterminations Saint Maximus the, the confessor writes extensively of them in, in all of his works that deal with the logos and the logoi distinction but what some Maximus the confessor doesn't do is stick them in the divine essence because n nobody in the East thinks that we know the divine essence nor that we stick I mean the divine essence is impersonal okay God's nature is impersonal whatever it is it's not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because nature and person aren't the same thing as St. John of Damascus says that's what the heretics say that's what modalists say right? St. John says that the heretics say that nature and person are the same so the divine ideas aren't something personal the blueprints for things are impersonal why? because they're stuck in the divine essence which is impersonal it makes no sense I would think that if God created things, he would create them according to his rational, personal energies, if you will. And I don't, I don't mean his person as an energy, but it's, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who create, okay, not the divine essence. Um, in the next question, he says, is there will in God? Yes. The will of God is his essence, he says. This is uh, Article 1, Question 19. As God's intellect is his own existence, so is his will. The will of God is his essence, he says in, re in reply to Objection 3. These things are not distinct from the divine essence, he says in reply to Objection 2. So... God's will is also now identified with the divine essence, which is all of those other, any other predicate. So basically, God is just a big impersonal monad. Now, does that mean that Thomas doesn't say that God's personal? Yes, he does. What? A, how can I say that? Because Thomas doesn't say that the per, that, that God is personal. Simply put, distinct from his essence. Thomas says that in question 29, article 2, that person is exactly the same as essence. Maybe, maybe we've misunderstood him. Maybe he makes himself clearer. Skip over to question 39. Question 39, Thomas talks about it again. What does he say there? Question 39, Article 1. Whether in God, essence is the same as person. On the contrary, as Augustine says on the Trinity, chapter or book 6, chapter 7, when we say the person of the Father, we mean nothing else than the substance of the Father. 